about motherhood. One minute, your mom of the year. I love you, mommy. Then the next? <laughs> mm, not so much. From bath time to bullying, from potty training to puberty, parenting is full of challenges. But one thing is for certain, you are not alone. Welcome to Modern Mom Probs. I'm your host, author, mother, parenting expert, Tara Clark. Join me while we tackle today's Modern Mom Problems. Hello and welcome back to another episode of Modern Mom Probs. I am your host, Tara Clark. I'm so thrilled to be joined by Liliana Vasquez. She is an Emmy-winning host, a TV personality, a fashion expert who hopefully will give me some advice later, a producer, and a mother to an adorable one-year-old. Today, we're going to be talking about milestones in motherhood. Liliana Vasquez, thank you so much for joining today. Oh, thank you so much for having me. And thank you for that wonderful introduction. Oh, I, I'm so thrilled that, that you're here. So tell everyone a little bit about yourself and how you got to be this multi-hyphenated, multi-fascinated woman that you are today. Well, you know, I had to really work hard for those hyphens. And I think sometimes people don't really acknowledge how hard it is to do multiple things exceptionally well. And we almost downplay all of the skills that we have and all of the hats that we wear as women, as moms, as professionals. And I thought, you know what? No, the more the merrier. I I don't want to be locked in a traditional box of what it means to be just a host or what it means to be just an influencer or what it means to just be a producer. I can do all of those things at an incredibly high level. Why not do them all? And it took a lot of work to get here. You know, I've never had a linear path to to my career. I started in fashion. I was an assistant at W Magazine many, many moons ago, got almost two decades ago. And from there, you know, I went on to work at an ad agency. I started my own accessories company. And ultimately, I found myself to blogging. I mean, I started a blog back when people thought blogging was like a disease that you had and, and not <laughs> something that you wrote. I remember people would say to me, what do you mean a blog? And I said, well, you know, it's on the internet, so it's free and people go there to find information and read about topics that they're interested in. They're like, well, how many people exactly? And I said, well, thousands of people to be exact. And people just weren't familiar with the idea of a blog. I mean, I predated the word influencer. I started my blog in 2008 and it really was just kind of the wild, wild west of blogging back then. But I was really fortunate to start very early and to make an impact with a topic that I think was obviously very important in 2008 with the economic crisis that we all face, but that still resonates today, which is people want to make smart decisions about finances. And in that smart decision-making, they don't want to lose the things that they love. And for me, that was fashion, that's style, it's beauty. And so, you know, I started blogging about ways to really create value in your closet, in your medicine cabinet, with your products, in your beauty bag. And I was very fortunate that you know, that struck a chord with a lot of young women. And it led to amazing opportunities that ultimately found me on the Today Show talking about my blog. It took a long time to get there. And I'm like, you know, ignoring the fact that for two years, they ghosted me, but that's okay, we'll get over it. (laughs) You know, and I spent seven years at the Today Show. And I turned what was, you know, one expert appearance to appear on Kathy Lee and Hoda into a seven year long career there, I became a contributor for that show. And ultimately, it gave me the platform to be able to go on and be a host on Access Hollywood. And ultimately, the first Latina host of E! News in the show's almost 30-year history. And here I am today, right, with a you know, with two Emmys and an incredible career that I'm so proud of, but it was not easy. And the journey often looked like I was, you know, swinging from like limb to limb on like an upside down jungle gym. But, you know, that's kind of what I think careers actually look like. I think it's a I I think it's a myth that our careers are naturally linear or that we don't take steps back or sideways or forwards or upside down. And I'm living proof that it's okay to take all of those steps and, and pivot a million times before you figure out what the right direction is for you. I love that so much. I may like jump through the computer and give you a hug for that <laughs> because that that sort of, I mean, no, nowhere the, the scale of it, but it's similar to, to my career in as much as when I started my Instagram account, people were like, what do you mean you're going to start an Instagram account? And I was like, yeah, well, you know, I'm going to start an Instagram account. It's going to be about parenting and I'm going to make jokes and this and that. And they're like, what? What are you talking about? And this was in 2016. So it's a a similar sort of thing. And so I just, I love that. I love everything that you said about careers not being linear. And sometimes our lives just in general 
don't yeah. end up in the same way that you imagine it to be, right? Like even creating a family, right? I struggled with fertility issues. I know you struggled with yes. fertility issues. If For you years. feel comfortable, would you oh mind gosh. sharing your story with us? Of course. Well, so I'm 41. I'm turning 42 next month. And Happy birthday. You know, Thank you so much. It's airy season. Everybody yes. better watch out. Everybody hey, better watch. I actually just had a birthday and I turned 42. So we're the same age, same Aries. Go. I, I mean, listen, this is a tough time to not be an Aries. This is our season. So back off. But I always say, so yeah, so I, you know, I started my journey to parenthood kind of in an unconventional way. I think at 35, most of my friends had really made the decision that they wanted to be a mom. It was something that was a big priority for them. And I knew that motherhood was in my future. It just wasn't in my present at 35. I had just started as a host on Meredith Vieira's show. I was still working at the Today Show. So I was handling two very high profile jobs on NBC, on network television during the day. And I just didn't see where I was going to find time to A, be pregnant and be like, actually take care of a baby. But that being said, I always knew that I wanted to be a parent and I knew that 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 was going to be in my future. And I had an awesome doctor who kind of in my yearly routine was like, listen, not trying to pressure you. Don't care when you want to have kids, if you want to have kids and shout out to my doctor, because most doctors, you know, there's a lot of discriminatory practices there. You hear a lot of really uncomfortable things said to you. She was like, totally no pressure. She just said, but if you're thinking about it, at 35, I just want to like run a couple of tests. It's a couple of extra tests. You're going to have blood work done anyway. Do you mind? And I said, no, that would be great. The more information, the better. I've always been an advocate of really understanding health and understanding, you know, medicine and how it applies to you and knowing all of your options. And like, for me, the more tests, the better. So she ran a panel of tests on me. And one of the tests she ran was called an AMH test. AMH stands for anti-mullerian hormone. And it's one indicator of your egg quantity, not your quality, but your quantity. And it's just a very preliminary test that you can take just to kind of see how things are looking at 35. Because as you know, we're born with all the eggs we're ever going to make. You don't make more eggs. Men make more sperm. Women do not make more eggs. And we lose those eggs as we age. And every period you lose them. And every day you're losing them. And by 35, you know, you're starting to reach the point where you're starting to drop off a lot in terms of quantity. And so she ran the test. I thought nothing of it. And then I got a call, you know, a few days later, I was about to go live on Meredith's show. And she said, do you have a minute to talk? And I immediately thought I had ovarian cancer or uterine cancer or something was terribly wrong. And I said, is everything okay? She said, yeah, everything is fine. I just want to go over some results from your test that I took specifically regarding fertility. And I said, what? And she said, yeah, she goes, I ran an anti-malarian hormone test on you. And I said, oh, wait, wait, no, no, that's a mistake. I'm not like traveling. Like, why would you have run like a malaria test on me? And she said, no, it's not malaria. It's mullerian. And I said, (laughs) oh, okay. But, you know, I'm somebody who's pretty well educated about reproductive health. And I had never heard that test or that name. I haven't either. Yeah. And she said, you know, your levels came back virtually undetectable. I'm pretty sure it's a lab error because you're 35 and your levels are on par with somebody that would be premenopausal or menopausal. She said, so let's just have you come back in and run the test again. And I said, okay, but is everything else okay? She said, yeah, everything is great. I said, okay, cool. So I went back in, we ran the test again. She called me two days later and she said, We ran the test again, and this time it's lower than the first time. Something is definitely going on, and I'm going to refer you to a fertility doctor. And I said, I'm not ready to have a baby. And she said, well, she goes, I think that you need to talk to somebody before you make that decision for yourself. And it was the first time that I realized how badly I wanted to be a mother, and I really felt it because it was the first time that I felt it being taken away from me. And sometimes it really does take somebody trying to take something from you to realize how badly you really want something. And so I went to go see what was my very first fertility doctor, not my last. And she was amazing. And she confirmed the results and did a full panel of tests. And I always talk about this full panel because an AMH test is just one single test. There's a series of tests that need to be done in order to almost triangulate really where you are. And also you need to have an intrauterine ultrasound done to really see what the follicles are doing, how many eggs are there, how many follicles are there. And it's a really complicated thing, but it's actually like really accessible. And it was complicated in the sense that I didn't know what I was doing at 35. 
IVF. I had I never heard of these procedures before. Most people, when they start seeing an IVF doctor, have been trying to have a baby for a year. They're experts at this. I knew nothing. And so I was thrown into this world really uneducated, which is where my passion for education around IVF comes from, because I was that person. I knew nothing. And sure enough, you know, it ended up being that she was right. You know, the, the test confirmed what we now know is that I kind of suffered from this very low egg quantity. It didn't mean that the quality of eggs I was producing was bad or that wouldn't result in a baby, but I just had very few eggs. And what that also meant is that IVF was not necessarily going to be successful for somebody like me. I think oftentimes we feel like IVF is kind of this like cure-all for babies. And if you can't have a baby naturally, okay, cool. I'll just go through IVF and then I'll just have like a healthy, happy baby. That's also not the case. IVF can work, but it can also fail. And it often fails a lot, especially in women over the age of 37. And so, you know, I'm always very honest about that because I think I went into it thinking, oh, well, it's fine if I have low AMH because I can just do IVF one time and I'll have a baby and no big deal. Well, that's not true. I went through almost a dozen canceled cycles because I wasn't producing enough eggs to even have a retrieval. I went through multiple retrievals just to really end up with one or two eggs where most women my age are ending up with a dozen to two dozen eggs. And then after that, you know, the eggs have to, you know, fertilize and then they have to survive to get to a day five embryo. It's a very long and lengthy process. And ultimately this ended up taking six years for me to get pregnant. So I started in 2015 and I finally was pregnant in October of 2020 and I ended up having my baby July of 2021 and now I have a beautiful almost nine month old baby, but I went through the ringer and I spent a fortune and my body went through hell and back over a dozen times and it is not something that was easy. It was something that I went through privately because I was almost ashamed to be going through something like that. And I didn't really know that I needed to, I guess, share in order to find strength. I felt like there was strength in doing it on my own. And I now know that that was a huge mistake. And, you know, I think what being pregnant and going through this really taught me was how to be vulnerable for the first time in my life. And I wish I had learned that lesson while I was going through IVF, because I think I would have been able to deal with my emotions better and also just manage you know, everything about it better, but you know, hindsight is twenty twenty, And now I'm, you know, I, I share the story because I don't want women to suffer in silence. I don't want women through go, to go through IVF alone. I don't want women to go through miscarriage alone or the loss of a transfer alone. It's so isolating. It's so painful. And there is so much loss to process that you just can't do it by yourself. And your partner is an amazing resource, but your partner can't be the only person that shoulders that with you. It really takes a community to get you through it. This podcast is brought to you by Citizens of Sound, a podcast production agency committed to developing and launching shows with gravity and depth. From conception to launch, Citizens will partner with you every step of the way, Whether you're an actor, business owner, doctor, fitness coach, influencer, or simply a hobbyist, Citizens offers everything from conception to branding, editing to mixing, and publishing to management. Jump on board with Citizens of Sound and start your own podcast today. Go to citizensofsound.com and follow them on Instagram. I'm so glad that we're talking. Thank you for sharing your story. Of course. I'm so glad that we're speaking about that because when my husband and I were having difficulty, we had three miscarriages and then we had- Sorry. Thank you. And then we had unexplained infertility, which ended up being polyps. And and then we had four IUIs and my son was conceived on the fourth IUI. It was the last one before we were about to start to do IVF. It was like a several year series of, of events, yeah. just like you said. And we also didn't tell anyone else. So mm-hmm. we bared the brunt yeah. of this, and this was all on our shoulders just together. Ugh. We didn't tell family. Some of our friends knew, but we really kept it very tight-lipped because we were ashamed, and yeah. we didn't think that other people would understand. It took me 10 years to be able to talk about miscarriage wow. and loss because if if my you know initial children would have lived, they'd be like, oh my goodness, like 12, 13 years old now. Oh They'd be like gosh. big children. Big. Yeah. yeah. You'd have middle schoolers. And I would have middle schoolers now. 
And so it took me years, years, years to be able to have the platform and have the confidence to be able to share my story and then speak with other mothers who can share their story too. So thank you so much for sharing. I really appreciate that. Of course. And it's so interesting to hear that. You know, I think a lot of times, you know, now I think women are finding their way to being really comfortable speaking so publicly about their journeys. And I follow all these Instagram accounts and people are sharing, you know, their weekly updates, almost using Instagram and, you know, Twitter almost kind of as like a digital journal for themselves. And I love seeing that. Like it almost, it's like almost makes me cry because like, I can't imagine like how supported I would have felt going through that and being able to share. And, you know, I think for me, it was almost kind of like, aside from shame, I didn't want to be pitied. Like I didn't want people to look at me and be like, Oh, I feel so bad for them. They can't have children. Like I, I didn't want that, but that's really not what people feel when you're going through that. No. What they want to do is just like help you, right? They, they just want to like, like offer... hug you and bring you in and yeah. say, Here, let me make you some food and let's sit down yes. at the dinner table and talk yes. about it. Yes. So it's really wonderful to see that so many women are really taking advantage of like, the, I would say like, just like the infinite arms and warmth of, of the internet. You know, we hear so much bad about social media and so much bad about being online and chat boards and all of these things. But at the same time, like when you look at it in situations like this, it's really just, it's so heartwarming to see women come together this way for each other. It really is. It's so beautiful. How was infertility viewed in the Latina community? Mm. You know, it's, it's a, to me, I feel like it's still a really taboo topic. I think there's these really dangerous tropes and stereotypes that exist in the Latinx community about women and fertility that, you know, Latinas are born fertile, that we can just like, you know, snap Stop. our fingers and the baby comes. And I think that comes from, you know, just like a lack of, I think it comes from a lack of talking about fertility issues. I think, you know, there's no statistic to prove that Latinas or Black women or Asian women have any higher a ability to get pregnant than white women. It's just that for some reason, especially first generation Latinx women don't talk about infertility. I think it's because our moms didn't talk about it and their moms didn't talk about it. And so it's never been modeled for us. We've never, you know, they suffered in silence. Maybe they told their sister, but that was it. And it was kept very private and very hush hush as if like something was wrong with you because you miscarried. And I think that's also, you know, part of the problem too. It's like, we don't even talk about sex in Latinx households. So if we don't talk about sex, are we going to talk about sex that happened and resulted in a miscarriage? Probably not. Are we also going to talk about male infertility in a culture that's defined by, you know, very like machismo type stereotypes? No, we're not going to talk about that. You know, are we going to talk about it in households that are very, very Catholic that don't want to talk openly about birth control for their daughters and sons? No. So there's all of these cultural things that prevent us and build really big barriers to conversation. And if you don't have conversation, you can't move forward through really difficult topics. And so it's the the stigma is really prevalent, I think, in Latinx communities and Black communities, especially I've talked to my Black friends that say the same thing. You know, they're like, we don't talk about it. And so I hope that as you see more women of color start to go through IVF very publicly. I hope that it opens up the doors to be having those conversations. And if they're not happening in your house, like you lead the conversation, you be responsible so that like your cousin or your prima or your aunt doesn't have to feel so alone in these conversations. But it's really hard because, you know, we are dominated by this kind of like old school stereotype and this kind of, like I said, it's like this trope, like, oh, like this kind of like barefoot and pregnant, like six kids later, you know, but that's just not the reality, you know, fertility, it doesn't discriminate. <laughs> it, it really doesn't. Yep. It doesn't work that way. And all of the things that I think we think about fertility, I think are also sometimes really outdated. So beautifully said. That's absolutely true. Liliana, you are a contributor with the Today Show, and you wrote a beautiful article celebrating milestones in a mother's life. And so often we talk about babies' milestones and toddler milestones and our children you know, hitting their developmental marks and all of those things. What prompted you to write an article about motherhood milestones? You know, it's so funny. It was one of those days. So my son turned six months and the stars just aligned on that day. I was able to like wash my hair and do my makeup and like put on a cute outfit. And I thought, wow, that's so funny that like on his six month birthday, he's doing amazing, like hitting all his milestones. I'm so proud of him. He's sleeping through the night. He was just like doing all the things right. And I said, but wait, so am I. (laughs) Like, 
is anyone going to acknowledge this or do I just have to celebrate on my own? And, you know, I love my Instagram account and I love the community that I've built there over the last, you know, 10 years. And I thought, you know, I feel like we don't do enough to celebrate moms through these milestones. So instead of posting a photo of my son on his six month birthday, I'm actually going to post a photo of myself today because I got my shit together and I have survived six months of like this massive disruption in my life that as prepared as I was, and let me tell you, I am like the queen of preparation. I was completely unprepared for. And, you know, in that six months, like, let's think about all of the things that I have survived, right? Because in the last six months, I survived a C-section, right? I survived sleep deprivation. I survived like breastfeeding. I mean, these are really big things, but guess what? I also survived like all of the tears and I survived like my husband feeling like a stranger, my body feeling like a stranger. And I started making a list of all of the things that I had survived in the last six months in my phone. And when I saw it, I thought if any other human being accomplished all of this, we would be giving them like trophies yes. on stage yes. In, yes. in in our gowns and in tuxedos yes. and yes. there would be ceremonies and perhaps yes. there might be statues built for them. Yes. And here I am second guessing whether or not I can like honor myself on Instagram, on my feed. And I thought, nope, I'm actually going to do it. So I posted it and for one second, I thought someone might say something. Someone might say, hey, like, why aren't you posting a photo of your beautiful baby? Well, I post photos of my beautiful baby all the time. I celebrate him every living second of every day. And I thought it was about time that I took a moment to honor myself. And I wanted to do it and not feel selfish about it because there was nothing selfish about it. And I also wanted to like say to my son, like, hey, listen, like we did this together. Like here we are like doing this dance and we did it. And like, you're living and breathing. I'm living and breathing. Like we did this together. So like, let's celebrate. Like I honored him by honoring my strength and my beauty and my resilience through the last six months. And it just really reframed how I was looking at things. And I think reframing things is also so important. I think there's just so much language that is almost like negative. Like there's not enough celebration in how we speak. You know, like I remember like when I got to, when I was breastfeeding and I said, so I think I said it out loud, like at a mommy and me class, I said, yeah, you know, I only breastfed, you know, for four months. And I said that, but that's not how I felt inside. Inside. I felt like, damn, like I made it four months. Like I'm so proud of myself. But something about the energy in the room and being around other mothers who were still breastfeeding made me take all of the joy and pride that I felt and put it through their filter. And it came out as, you know, I was only able to breastfeed for four months as if that was something to be ashamed about. If I had only breastfed for four weeks, that was still something good for me, like good for my baby and I that we did that for four weeks. Absolutely. that was the moment that I knew that I really had to shift how I used language to communicate about motherhood. And it changes your perspective when you change the words that you use. Like, I feel like if we honor what we accomplish, right, instead of thinking less of ourselves every time we don't do more, whatever more means to somebody else, like we can really do so much to kind of take away, I call it failure culture, that exist in mom land. And so that was what really sparked the article. It was really that, that picture and and that Instagram post. And then also like knowing that I felt really proud in that room to have breastfed for four months, but then pushing that down and shrinking and making that smaller because I felt like I should have done more. And I did more, I did what I could. And I was really proud of that. So I didn't want to shrink away from that feeling anymore. And I just thought I'm going to put it out there. So that's what really prompted and inspired that article. And I was so happy that, you know, the Today Show really honored that and said, hey, I know that this is not just a feeling that you're having. I think that this is a feeling that a lot of moms feel like, damn, like I'm, I'm really strong. Like, let me celebrate myself. Like we do so much for babies. We're like, oh, they rolled over. Well, like, how do you think they learned to roll over? Like, yes. 
Exactly. Guess, hello. Guess who's teaching that? <laughs> like, you know, how do you think they who's like doing tummy time? We're the ones helping tummy yes, time. Yes. Like you, it, it's a celebration that doesn't have to be exclusively baby or exclusively mom. It can be a shared celebration. I don't think they're mutually exclusive. This episode is brought to you by Modern Mom Style Box. Upgrade your wardrobe and enjoy unlimited styles for just $60 a month. Modern Mom Style Box is the first rental clothing subscription designed exclusively for moms and moms-to-be. Get started today with a free trial. Use promo code PTO. It's such a beautiful perspective shift. I think that's so important. So how can other moms then (laughs) celebrate these wins? Yeah. Well, I think number one, like ask your partner to celebrate you. You know, I don't think there's any harm in asking for things. You know, it's not something I do well. And it's something that I am in practice of actively is saying, Hey, tonight I'd like you to take the baby and I to dinner or just me to dinner. And I'd like you to celebrate like how wonderful of a job I'm doing as a mom. And it's okay to want that recognition. I think sometimes we think that like, oh, but like, it's what I should be doing. And like, you know, I'm just doing the bare minimum. No, it's not. It's really not. There's no bare minimum when it comes to raising a child. You are doing the absolute most at all times. So I think ask your partner to celebrate you. Ask your girlfriends to celebrate you. You know, I'm sure your friends are begging to like take you out to like a brunch or like a dinner and be like, yes, actually, I would like to go out and I'd like it to be a celebration. Buy cake buy cupcakes for yourself, you know, like celebration can be anything. It could be a manicure, you know, celebration doesn't have to be some like big over the top thing. It could be a post on Instagram. It can be like a lunch alone without a baby. It can also be like meditation, you know, like I always say like celebration finds itself present in your life in so many different ways. Um, often we think like it's gotta be a party or it's gotta be a gift, but like if you find little ways to celebrate yourself, I think we would be more, I mean, it would be probably more inclined to celebrate ourselves more often. And wouldn't that be a better thing? Yes. Yes. I am all about celebrations. I am all about high vibe celebrations. Let's do it. Let's bake the cupcakes and then let's eat them. And then let's go out with our friends. Because everyone throws us a- Yeah, exactly. Everyone throws us a baby shower while we're pregnant. So it's like, hey, congratulations, you're pregnant. But what about like, hey, congratulations, now you've sleep trained. And and now you're being seen through the night. Yeah. I mean, I often think it's like, we're just like, it's like after the baby, like everybody celebrates up until they get here and then they go away and you're like, Whoa, what happened to all the people? Like what happened to all the celebration? Like, where did that go? And like, you know, even now when my friends have babies, like I make it a point and this is because somebody did this for me. I don't send a baby gift for the baby. I send a gift for the mom. A friend did that for me. And I broke down in tears when I received it because nobody was thinking of me in that way. And it felt so nice to be seen and to be recognized and to open something for myself that somebody else just gave to me and not feel guilty. Like it was, it was such a small gesture and it was such a small gift, but that's what I do now. Like you can have all the baby registries you want. I'm, I'm not going to send a gift for your baby because your baby's going to get a thousand gifts. I'm going to send a gift for them all. And it's, you know, and if you don't want it and you want to return it and exchange it for something for the baby, more power to you, do whatever you want. But I want to continue to pass on the feeling that my friend gave me when I opened that incredibly thoughtful gift. That is so thoughtful. I I love that. I'm going to switch gears now. All right. Mm -hmm. Are you ready for this? We're going to start the rapid (laughs) fire series of questions. Don't worry. It's nothing crazy. It's actually pretty tame. What's your favorite comfort food? Warm chocolate chip cookies fresh out of the oven. Oh, that's a good one. Mm, you're making me hunger for, for a cup of coffee and chocolate chip cookies now. What's your favorite 90s movie? Oh, can it be late 80s? Yeah, sure. Can't Buy Me Love? Oh, good one. Good one. I think it's 80, so it's like two years off. Yeah, okay. That counts. That counts. That totally counts. One person gave me a movie from the 60s, and I was like, I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> then then 88 definitely makes it <laughs> totally counts it totally counts who is your favorite cartoon character gosh that's a great question i don't know that anyone's ever asked me that probably garfield i have like a really sentimental attachment to him because my little brother loved him so much and i just remember like watching endless hours of garfield with him and like it just made him so happy so i feel like and i love that he's like a moody grumpy cat i feel like he's like my like long lost soul sister 
Love it. And I feel like also when we were kids, Garfield was on a lot. It was just mm-hmm. always on, like every Saturday morning. Yeah. I feel like it was just like yeah. always on. You are a style expert. What yes. is your favorite grooming thing grooming that you do for yourself? Thing. Self-grooming. Brow limb? Oh, do I have to do it myself or can someone do it for me? Uh, yeah, it doesn't count. It doesn't matter. Either way, someone could do it for you. You don't have to do it. I'm obsessed with getting my brows laminated. Oh, do tell. Okay, explain this to me. So brow lamination is not microblading. Microblading is when they do like kind of the temporary tattoos. Lamination is basically a straight perm for your eyebrows. And what that does is it allows them to kind of sit straight up, almost as if you've just brushed them out. But they stay like that for about four to six weeks. I mean, it kind of just gives you like the illusion of a much fluffier, fuller brow because instead of your eyebrow hairs, which naturally have a curve to them, obviously, like they kind of lay left to right or right to left, depending on which one, they then kind of laminate them so that they stick straight up. And then you just fill them in and then put a little bit of brow gel. And your brows always look like perfectly done. It's like a very beautiful boy brow. So I'm obsessed with that. You just blew my mind, and now I have to Google for brow laminations in yes. my area. Yes, but don't do it. I mean, I think there's like an at-home kit, but it's like a professionals only yeah. situation. Hard yeah. pass on me doing anything yeah, yeah, like yeah, that yeah. at home yeah. by yeah, myself. Totally. <laughs> totally. Hard knowing that. And although this is audio only, I have to tell you, Liliana's eyebrows are perfect. <laughs> they are Thanks. absolutely on point. They You're so sweet. I'm like completely makeup less, wet hair out of the shower, but I appreciate she the compliment. She is stunningly I will take it. gorgeous. I will take stunning. it. Stunning. Absolutely stunning. Absolutely stunning. Last question. What is your favorite song lyric and why? Oh God. It's, it's a John Denver song lyric. It's hold me like you'll never let me go. I think that it's, it was, it's what I inscribed in my husband's wedding ring that he lost 15 years ago. But <laughs> yeah, I think there's some, there's such a beautiful sentiment. And then I try to kind of evoke that sentiment every time you're like hugging someone because you just never know, you know, and especially if, given the last two years that we've all had, you just really don't know when the last time is. So I think like take all of those moments for granted and make somebody feel like you're not going to let go every time you have the I mean, I think it's such a gift to be able to hug somebody. And I think we all realize that after the last two years we've had. Isn't that the truth? <laughs> Was there anyone that you hadn't seen in a really long time and you finally saw them and you said, yes, and you just like gave them the biggest hug? Oh, yeah, for sure. I, my friend George, I just, I, I, he's like pure joy and I was so used, you know, you get so used to seeing people, you take it for granted and you did, you realize how much you miss their energy. I mean, there's only so much that can happen between the phone and Zoom, but in real life, like their energy is palpable. And that's how George is. He just comes into a room and the whole room just like wakes up and I missed it so much. So I was so happy to finally get to see that. Just, he's an angel. So I was so happy to be able to be with him in real life. Love that. Shout out to George. <laughs> <laughs> Liliana, thank you so much for being here today. Tell everybody where we can find you, how we could follow you, and what's next for you. Totally. So you can obviously follow me on Instagram. I am just at Liliana Vasquez. But if you really want to kind of like poke my brain, step into my closet, and access all of my style tips and tricks, the best place to find me is on my website. It's lilianavasquez.com. And that's the home of my blog which is called the LV guide. And there you can sign up for our weekly newsletter. You can sign up for, or we have digital magazines that come out every quarter. It's all free, no ads. I might add, cause I know some people are like, wait, no, it's all just like the best way to live your most stylish life effortlessly. So who doesn't want that? Right. And then what's next for me? Great question. I started a production company while I was on maternity leave. So I'm rolling out some really fun projects over the next few months, um, both in front of the camera and most excitingly behind the camera as a producer. It's kind of something I've always wanted to do that I was always too afraid to do because I thought people would, you know, judge me or say I didn't have the credentials or the experience. And, you know, giving birth made me a superhero. So I thought, let me channel that energy into my professional life. And so our production company was born along with my baby. So it's my other baby. It's my work baby. Um, So yeah, I expect to see a lot of really cool, fun content in the next few months. I love it. I love it. The LV guide is gorgeous, by the way. I want to like jump into it and just simply live there. I just want to (laughs) live in the LV guide. It is is beautiful. Everyone needs to follow it. It is fantastic. Thank you. Liliana, thank you so, so much for being here today. We'll see you soon. Thank you so much for having me.
Thanks for listening to today's episode of Modern Mom Probs. I hope you enjoyed our deep dive in today's problem with me, your host, Tara Clark. Join me next time when I'll be interviewing another great guest and tackling another modern mom problem. If you enjoyed today's episode, please leave us a review and a rating. As always, you could head over to Modern Mom Probs on Instagram and give me a follow or check out my book, Modern Mom Probs, A Survival Guide for 21st Century Mothers, available online wherever books are sold. Well, that's it for today. See you next time, folks.